this lovely red button. People press it, and it produces a random episode of a random Jerry Anderson show, and then we have to watch it. Some news from the world of Jerry Anderson, uh, and a little event in Slough. I'll be bringing you the first part of my interview with Space Precinct alumnus David Quilter. The Jerry Anderson Podcast with Jamie Anderson, Richard James, and Chris Dale. It's pod two, three, four. No, it's not. It's pod four, three. What? What is it? Three, two, two four. four. Of the Jerry Anderson podcast. Yay! Well done. That's a good start. Well done for saying some numbers in uh, order. It's our opportunity to celebrate the legacy of one of the foremost producers of his generation. Who's uh, that then? Well, it's Jerry Anderson. Ah, a name thanks. you might well be familiar with. And it's also with. your opportunity. Uh, exactly. A lovely podstrons. Now, who yeah, is David Quilter? For those Sergeant, who don't know, Sergeant Fredo. Calamandro in the Fire Within, Sandoff in yeah. another Hate one. Street. Was it Hate Street? Yeah. Yes, I think it was. And also there's a Vinny Artak, of course, Vinny in Artac. Stand. Oh, Everybody you know what Vinny yeah, Big love, space precinct. Love Vinny. Fan. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so, yeah, lovely to have um, someone from uh, Precinct 88 in the, uh, in the interview chair yeah. to celebrate Space Precinct's 30th anniversary. Which is coming up very soon. Yes. I mean, neither of us could quite believe it that, you know, we'd be sat here 30 years later still talking about that bloody show. <laughs> Crazy. It is bonkers. Is it about time we had some Jerry Anderson news? Oh, I suppose. Already? We've only just started. Come on. Yeah. Jerry Anderson news it is then. Newsy news, news, news. Newsy news, 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 news indeed. Yes. News. What you got for us? A uh, couple of things. Good. Should we start in Slough because that's where we are right now? Yeah. yeah? Go on then. Agreed? Yeah. yeah. Well, is this uh, about the new restaurant that's open just down the road that we're going to try? Jim's? Yeah. No, but I'm oh, very excited ooh. to try it. Fair enough. Uh, no, this is an event at the Slough Museum at the end of August. Ah. Uh, so to celebrate 60 years of Thunderbirds, which I'm sure lots of you will go, ah, oh, that's next year. Yeah. Well, they're celebrating 60 years since the production started first, and then they're doing a big uh, celebration oh, next year. Gotcha. Well, uh, Saturday the 31st of August and mm -hmm. Sunday the 1st of September at the Slough Museum, they're doing a kind of exhibition celebration and show and tell. Oh! So if you are within reach of Slough and would like to pop down to Slough Museum, you can basically bring your favourite item or items connected to Thunderbirds and be part of the display that weekend. Brilliant. And they've got nice, safe lockable cabinets for display mm -hmm. and you do not have to present anything about your item you, yeah. you can you know present you can you can hand it over and then fade into the background or you can stand there all day telling everybody about your wonderful lady penelope thermos that you've had since 1966 oh, that's what yes. i'm doing that's your yeah fade that's, into the background in yeah, this never. shirt no no but uh, just to say it's yeah. a low pressure thing but yeah. it's a lovely celebration you'll meet other collectors you'll you'll see props and other bits and pieces meet some nice people I also might be there for one of the days. Oh, there's um, a threat. Yeah. Yes. You won't let us know which day you're going to be on so we could avoid it. Yeah, of course I will, in due course. <laughs> I shall tweet it or X it in due course. Oh, okay. um, but yes, it's a lovely thing. There's some more information about it on the Jerry Anderson website, jerryanderson.com. And if you can make it, it would be a nice thing to do. Yes. I mean, don't, you know, don't schlep over from Canada or something. Oh, but no. right, if you're enough. within, you know, an hour, yeah. half an hour of Slough, then yeah. it might be a nice thing to do and pop down and start celebrations. Yeah. And if you do do that, then when Slough Museum has its bigger thing next year, which will be a multi-week, multi-month event, you might be able to be part of that as well. Mm, That's a nice little testing ground. And once you've been there, you can uh, come and have a drink at the Moxie. I mean, I would. Yeah. Well, oh. we're here anyway, aren't we? So. Well, yeah, true. Yeah. A Tracy Island iced tea. Yeah. That's very nice. They are <laughs> How delicious. <laughs> or a succulent Chinese meal. Or indeed. Oh. Yeah. oh. Nice. That'd be a fun weekend, yeah. wouldn't it? Great. Have you got a bit of news? Uh, well, I have got a bit of news You've and news. a bit of a competition. Hang on. Is Ooh. it space precinct related? I've written a space precinct book. Oh, another one. <laughs> another one. So to celebrate 30 years of DCPD Space Precinct, 1994 to 1995, Pyramid Studios, LNM stage, <laughs> I've written, well, it's, it's a space precinct adventure like no other, <gasps> in which oh. I ask the question, what would have happened if Brogan had never been transferred to that other precinct. What? Whoa. A hypothetical? A hypothetical. Or is it somehow tied to the original series? Of course it's tied to the original series, Ooh. featuring the return of a very popular foe. Oh. And a less popular foe. Oh, I can't wait for you to read it. Oh, now, Podstroms, I'm running a little competition. Would you like your name to feature 
in the book. So there are various characters that we meet along the way. Uh, some police officers, of course, and Creons and Tarns, and mm-hmm, other aliens, mm-hmm, of course. Mm-hmm. Any of these? Uh, yeah, that's ones right. Well, maybe they, may, they might turn up, but not in the way you might expect. So, Gosh. if you would like your name featured in the book, simply email podcast at jerryanderson.com. Okay? In the subject line, I would like you to write Space Precinct Competition. In the body of the email, please write the answer to this question. Slow-mo, very famously was the robot in the station house, was an RSA unit. What do the initials RSA stand for, Chris? Okay, answer that question in the body of the email and then write, I would like the name, could be your name, could be a friend's name, do you want your full name, surname, first name? I don't know, it's up to you. I would like the name blank to feature in the book. It's quite easy. So, subject line, space precinct competition. In the body of the email, slow-mo is an RSA. It stands for... <clears throat> and I would like the name blank to feature in the book. You have one week. You have one week, because I've got to get you the yeah. manuscript. Yeah, so you've, you've got the end of this week, that's it. So... It's right. simpler. It couldn't really, could it? I mean, I, have I overcomplicated it? No, no, I, no. I, I think you could have presented it in a simpler way, but overall, <laughs> I think we're all clear now. Fine. Great. Yeah. Uh, and that'll be out in due course, I mean, I guess in time, hopefully, for the uh, anniversary month, which is, what, October? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, certainly yes. between the anniversary month and, and, next a, and the following month. <laughs> yeah, and the 31st anniversary. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Are we in it? No. No? Oh. You can't find a pair of phones or junkies the or something in the you? slum of Demeter. You that need we to could... email and enter yeah. the competition, like everyone else. Yeah, I can't wait for you to read it. No, I think terms and conditions apply, yeah. and people working with Anderson Entertainment. Here's answer. a little spoiler. I will tell you that Symptom Squab does feature. Well, well, now you've got to get it, haven't you? Yeah. There we go. That's all my news. Can't wait. Yeah. Okay. Are we doing Stingray news as well? Oh, so this is the second Marine Minute. It is, yes. Yeah. Uh, Network Error, which uh, yeah. launched just uh, a couple of weeks ago on the YouTube channel. Yes, mm. but you should may not have seen it yet. Should we pop it in here in the podcast? Well, yeah, particularly because it leads... Well, should we explain what a Marine Minute is oh, for well. those who don't know? These on, are, are part of our, our deadly uprising, Quick. 60th anniversary in saga, yep. in which we, we sort of make these little interstitial yep. stories between That's the right. larger events. Go on, then explain it. Oh, oh, you just did. I just did? Yeah. Watch this. Approach in first position, Troy. Okay, phones. I'll take Stingray down here. Better keep that remote-controlled freighter in position until we've checked the area. Standing by. Diving now. Commence sound scan. Sound scan operating. Sure picked a good spot to start this little endeavor. Yeah, we're far enough from Titanica that we should be able to install the first few aqua listing devices unnoticed. It'll be the last couple that take us closer to Titan's territory and potential trouble. We know Stingray can handle herself when it comes to mechanical fish. Guess that's why the commander has us playing nursemaid to that glorified pile of electronics up there. Right. All the same, escort duty isn't exactly the most exciting way to pass a day. Hold it, Troy. I've got something. 2,000 yards bearing green 045. A mechanical fish? Too small. But it's definitely an underwater craft of some kind. Let's check it out. Troy, look. That alien craft is heading straight for the freighter. Stand by, number one sting. Standing by. Fire! Direct hit! Good shooting, Skipper! Area is clear of additional contacts. Stingray calling Marineville. Are you receiving me? Over. Read you, Stingray. Is anything wrong? We had a lone alien craft down here making trouble, but we've taken care of it. Confirm that we're about to commence operation. Understood, Stingray. We'll await your next routine report. PWOR. 
Release first listening device, phones. Deploying now. What was that you were saying before about a lack of excitement? Guess I'd better be more careful what I wish for. Marina, Aqua Marina, why don't you say that you'll always stay close to my heart? Go network oh, error. Oh, oh, oh. So, what was Stingray doing there? Why were they laying all that? Well, yes, what's going on, Chris? If you want to find out what happens from there, you have to buy my book. Oh, oh yeah, because I've written a book too. Have yes. You? Stingray, oh. the Titanic and the I mean, Stratagem. It's we'll not continue like, that story. It's not like we spent two weeks talking about that, is it? No, no, no. no, no, no I'm very yeah. humble. Anyway. Fantastic. Well done. Great. There we are. Have you written a book? No. Oh. <clears throat> I wrote an email this morning. <laughs> okay, it's a start, isn't it? Oh, well, yeah, go and buy Titanic and Stratagem, please. <laughs> and that's the end of this week's Jerry Anderson News. Newsy news, newsy news. That was the news, that was the news. That doesn't even fit the, the theme, though. That no, but I that's use. the supercar theme. Yeah, but so. it doesn't fit the... Da, 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 da. Oh, How's I it? think we've moved beyond that now. Whoa, OK. I mean, if you want to bring it back... No, that's fine. Talking of bringing things back... Yes. Shall we bring back David Quilter from the depths... Of the station house Ooh. from Space Precinct circa 1994 yes. and ask him some questions about said program. Yeah. Why? All right. It's well, here nice he is. Man. Yeah. David Quilter. I must say, you look very different without your mask. Well, yes, and, and that's to be expected, I think. Would you have imagined 30 years ago that you would now be sitting opposite me around a table talking about Space Precinct for a Jerry Anderson podcast? Yes, I would. I mean, it's it's what I've been waiting for for 30 years. <laughs> really? It should have happened sooner, you mean? <laughs> yes, why didn't it? I mean, anyway, here we are now. Well, and thank you very much for joining us. I know you've come a long way today. A long way. A long, long way. Uh, talking of coming a long way, it's been a long road since Space Precinct, doesn't it? Yep. Can you quite believe it's been 30 years? No, I can't. I mean, there are elements of it that seem like yesterday. Yeah. Um, and even this morning. Yeah. But... Um, yeah, I mean, I, I remember when you pointed out to me that it was 20 years. Right. And that seems like yesterday. I mean, <laughs> yes, yeah, really quite weird. If, but yet, yeah, 30 years. If I were to drive you to Pinewood right now and drop you outside L&M studio, do you think you could make your way to your old dressing room yeah. and to the makeup room mm. and then onto set? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then you'd know where to find your lunch? Oh, that's a good question. Do you remember those lunches? Oh, we went to the pub. We did in time go to the pub, yes. Yeah. By the end of the series, we managed to convince our but makeup where, people to let us out. we have lunch otherwise? Do you remember we used to get, get delivered to the kind of little atrium area by the stairs where they had those brown leather sofas and they'd, bring, yeah. they'd leave our lunch there under tinfoil? Oh, yes, do I do remember that. Like stew and sticky toffee pudding yes, and fish. Like and school dinners. And it was always semi-cold by the time we got to it, I remember. Yeah. Because, of course, we had to get out of the hole. That's why we went to the pub. <laughs> yeah, quite. Yeah, exactly. Uh, now, we are going to talk about Space Precinct, of course, in the main, because it's a Jerry about Anderson what? show. Do you not remember that? Oh! A much fondly remembered series. Of course. By about two or three people. Um, but we're also going to talk a little bit about some of your other credits as well, because mm. you have had, I think it's fair to say, a long and illustrious career so far. Long. <laughs> What's quite strange for me is that Space Precinct really was at the very beginning of my career. Mm. And it was sort of... In the middle. Yeah, yeah, the halfway point so far for you. Yep. So I'm, do you think that means that our experiences of it were very different? I don't know. I don't know what you'd done before. Very little. But some. Yeah, a day here, a day there, and a bit of theatre. Yeah, I well, that's what only... jobs are like, um, yeah, yeah. mostly. I mean, you know, um, and it became that much more like that, that, you know, you'd work for a day here and a day yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Um, whereas when I started in TV, even if you were doing a small part, you would be there mm. every day in the rehearsal room mm. and you would shoot it over two or three days multi-camera. I mean, that changed... Yeah. Totally. Yeah, that's right. 
mainly because of the Americans, because that's the, the, they were they shot it. They shot things, not just single camera, but on film. Yeah, um, and we didn't do that. Didn't quite go that far. Yeah, but we did um, cer certainly switch to because it was just cheaper. And um, so what's changed now is that you come onto set for your first or your only day's work. You wouldn't have had any rehearsal. No. Uh, essentially, the only rehearsal is for the camera. You get a line run. Yeah. And, and you'd be told where to stand. And yeah. The director might give you a note. And then thank you very much, goodbye. That's it. Yeah. We didn't have much rehearsal on Space Precinct, did we? I don't remember for each episode. No, just the usual filming setup. I mean, yeah. you know, you'd, you'd go, you'd, you'd be positioned, you'd go through the lines and you'd, um, yeah, and it, and it was for the camera. Yeah. And, so then, the, the director knew roughly what you were going to be doing. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Mm. All right. Now, we do play a game with each of our podcast guests. Uh, this is called Super Identification. Now, if you look at the screen in a moment, we're going to show you very, very quick clips of the opening titles of every one of Jerry Anderson's TV series from 1957 or something to 2004. I think there are 18 of them. And I want you to see which ones you can recognise. Shout out when you see something you know. Are you ready? Well, I'm going to probably be guessing. <laughs> Fine. OK. Let's guess. Number one. Tintin. <laughs> Number two. <laughs> Come on, you've got to be quicker. Oh. Um. No, some people do remember that one, Four Feather Falls. Yeah. Thunderbirds. Supercar. <laughs> um, that was five on XL5, followed by... Thunderbirds. Stingray. And now it's... Um, Stingray. <laughs> <laughs> Space 1999. No, no, that didn't even have puppets in it, David. Uh, ah, yes. Um, you won't remember that one. No, but I remember standing on it on when I met him. Did you? Yeah. Secret Service. That's Hilarious. Ah. Oh, yeah. Don't say Thunderbirds. Yeah. Well, you have mentioned this one already. Space 1999. Yes, I'll give you that one. An emergency. No, Terror Hawks. <laughs> you might know this one. Ah, oh, Space Precinct. A place of legend. Fabled right across the... No, Lavender Castle. And the last one here. That's the CGI version of Captain Scarlet. David. I mean, you know, you haven't done as badly as some. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, no, not at all. You got two. <laughs> out of ten? Uh, out of eighteen. Oh. <laughs> and one of those you were in. There you go, look. I got, got that one right. There. There's your little Thunderbirds oh, gosh. doll. There's you with number two on. Uh, and that will make its way around the front of the table there, on our league table. We'll see how you do alongside the others. OK. Um, but yes, you know, Maria Theresa Creasy got three. So, you know, you're in good company down there. But we can infer from that, David, that you were not a great Jerry Anderson fan when you got Space Precinct. Well, the thing was, I, I think when Jerry Anderson started, which I think was probably 60s. Yeah, yeah, late 50s. I was already 60s. a grown-up. Exactly, that's right. So I was not only a voraciously ambitious young actor mm. and, well. and hopefully busy, if not busy working, busy getting work, Yeah, um, I didn't watch children's TV. Yeah, why would you? Why would I? Yeah. But what do you remember as a child then? What did you watch as a kid? Did you go to the cinema often? I was or obsessed was TV? with cowboy things. Yes, so right. I watched The Cisco Kid. Right. Hop along, Cassidy. There's probably a podcast for all of these as well that you're going to have to appear on now. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, right. And um, I, I did watch children's TV then. There was, there was a sort of magazine program called Whirly Gig. Right. In yeah. which appeared Muffin the Mule. Uh, right, yes. I know Muffin, yes. Um, and it was presented by a chap called Humphrey Lestock. Right. Um... Yeah, but, and this was, I mean, there was one channel. Yeah. We had a tiny little pie television set with a screen like that in a cabinet like that. Yeah. Um, 
and the, the picture would screw, yeah. <laughs> be going like this, and you'd be twiddling with knobs and trying to make it stop. Yeah. Um, this was 1950. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, just so different. And uh, so, where did you grow up, and what sort of what were your what was your parents' background and so on? I mean, is it unusual that you decided to become an actor, or was that in in the blood? Well. No, it certainly wasn't in the... Well, it wasn't in the blood... No. My, my, funnily enough, two of my mother's sisters ran away from home and joined Southwold Rep <laughs> right. for a summer season. Right. Quite wired. And how they got away with it, I don't know. Yeah. Um, and I didn't even know this until after I'd started. No, I, I was... I mean, it came from a couple of things, really. Firstly, there was a boy at my school and it was announced that he'd got a scholarship to RADA. Uh -huh. I didn't know what they were talking about. Yeah. But I found out and I thought, wow. So he, you can actually be an actor for, as, a, as a job. Yeah. So that was my first inkling. And then I, my mother took me to Hornchurch Rep, Queen's Theatre Hornchurch, not the nice new sprucey one now, the yeah. old one. Yeah. And we went two weeks in a row. The first week we saw a, a Agatha Christie play. Um, it was then an unmentionable title. Right. Okay. Ten Little. Yeah. I think it's called... And then there were none, I think, now. Yes, I think it is. That's right. But it, it went through several titles. It did. Until it got sort of... <laughs> Politically correct. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and in it was a, a young actress called Gwen Watford, who became a big star, um, playing a maid. Mm. And the next week, we saw another play called Death of a Rat, about some um, experimental lab or something. Right. Um, and she was playing the lead. Right. And... There she was, and, and I thought, wow. A completely different performance. Completely different yeah. performance, and I mean, mm. she was suddenly a star. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I bumped into her at the television centre years later, and I said, you are responsible for this. <laughs> and she was appalled. Um, <laughs> but, uh, no, she was, she was absolutely lovely. But, uh, yeah, that, that was kind of what did it. Yeah. And uh, what, what, were your family particularly supportive or your school, were they supportive in your ambitions? Or? My school never knew. Right, OK. Um, and they still don't, so yeah. shut up. Well, um, I wouldn't say a word. <laughs> your secret's safe. But, um, no, my parents were, funnily enough. I mean, um, I was struggling with certain subjects. Maths. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I won't tell you how many times I failed maths O-level. right. Four. Right. <laughs> but shut up. Um, <laughs> wow. So you had so, to retake so, it again and again. And, and I was on a, on a sort of foundation architectural course. Oh, yeah. Well, without maths, forget it. Yeah. And anyway, my father sat me down and said, look, if you're not going to pursue this, is there something you do want to do? And I blurted out, I want to act. Ah. Thinking uh, he would say... Yeah. Never darken my doorstep <laughs> again. Yeah. Um, but no, he said, uh, well, OK, um, continue with your studies. <laughs> and um, in the meantime, join an amateur group and yeah. see, A, if you like it, and B, if you're any good. Yeah. So I did that. And uh, I, I did like it. I wasn't any good. But I, I knew that I knew. Yeah. I just knew. Yeah. And, I, and then I started audition. Then a bunch of us from that society started another society, a Shakespeare group, mm -hmm. and we did Taming of the Shrew, in which I played Biondello. And the, the director of that was the county drama advisor. Right. And um, so we invited him over, and he advised me on what to do, how to go about getting into drama school. So I applied for various drama schools, uh -huh. and got into Webber Douglas. Uh -huh. Sadly, no longer existent. That's right, yeah, yeah. Um, tragic, tragic, really, because yeah. it, was, it was great. Um, 
And I remember the first day walking in there and I just suddenly felt completely at home. Wow, wow. And it was, it was just my world. Mm. And I didn't really know why, but it just felt right. And was that feeling ever shaken or tested at all? Or no. have you always felt like that, no matter, you know, the ups and downs of, of an actor's life? But have you always felt that, that certainty? Yeah. 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 I've never wanted to do anything else. Yeah. Yeah. I still don't, really. Yeah. Uh, now, it may not surprise people to know, then, due to your sort of lack of Jerry Anderson knowledge, uh, you told me about your first Anderson memory. And, um, well, let's have a look and we'll talk about it afterwards. Captain, check out the latest report from Interplanetary. Could be linked to Nissim's murder. Now, this is from the first episode of really? Space Jim Precinct. And I, gang are making a run I think on the this might have been your first train. day's work. I'm not entirely sure. There's dead crystal dealers from here to Earth. They're wiping out the competition on a dozen planets. Including Altor, it seems. Nissim had this in his hand when he dropped in on us. Black crystal. At least two ounces worth. I'd say it was closer to three. And supposedly, a single gram will extend a human's life three years. Huh. Or a Creon's 20. And an entire species extinct in order to get it. You could buy half of Demeter with that rock. Then why didn't the killer take it? Because he didn't care about crystal. He was after Nissim. A real pro. Nah, not that professional. He left a witness. Here we are. Whoa. Double Duty, first episode of Space Precinct, is effectively your first Anderson memory, because it was certainly your first experience of the Jerry Anderson universe, yeah. having not watched any of it as a young man. Yep. Um, I mean, I was aware of it. Yeah. I mean, I was aware of Thunderbirds. Yeah. I never watched it because um, yeah. it wasn't for me, really. No, that's but, right. Yeah. But yeah. What were your initial feelings about Space Precinct, and what were your, your hopes and... Do you remember the, you know, the, the, the prevailing feeling on set in those early days about how the show might develop and where it might go? No. Mm. But, well, I mean, no, I, mean I, say, I say no because I, I, no, I didn't. I mean, because I was thrust into it and it would just take its course. I mean, yeah. you'd get the script yeah. and you'd read it and you'd learn it and um, it was... It was like any other job from that point of view. Yeah. But then, yeah. you know, there, there were the peripherals, like the heads yep. and, and the, all that stuff. You yeah. know, the, um, you, the, I mean, the first thing you do when you got in in the morning was get a chin stuck on. <laughs> yes, that's um, right. And so, it was, I mean, those were the differences. But then the, there are differences with every job. Mm. So... Mm. Yeah. I mean, I think most actors are pretty open-minded and and pretty accepting of whatever is thrown at them. Well, it's a gig, isn't it? It's a gig, and uh, and partly you do what you're told, mm -hmm. and partly you decide what you will do. Yeah. Um, and so, that in in that way, it was you know, to me, it was an acting job. And yeah, yeah. From my point of view, I remember because it was over a year, of course, and over twenty episodes. Although the characters were pretty set, they didn't go on any great spiritual or emotional journeys. Or well, that was part of the problem. Yeah. I mean, I, from what I know, I don't know the politics of the thing, but mm. I believe it was sort of rushed into production um, before it was really ready. Yeah. Um, and had it been kind of, you know, had, had there been a Bible, so to speak, yeah. it might have gone on for a lot longer. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, um, so it, it had a lot of potential, yeah. which wasn't realised. But it wasn't long before we were meeting Fredo's family. I don't know if you remember an episode. Oh, yeah. And your young daughter having a birthday. <laughs> Kieran Shah played. Yes. Who I'm hoping to speak to on the podcast here right. in, a, in a couple of months. So there was, I think there were efforts to try and broaden these characters as the show went on. I agree in a way, but, uh, but I, I don't think 
it was really explored. Yeah. I mean, it was it was an episode in which you you saw a bit of Fredo's family. Yeah. But then it, it went nowhere else after that. They sort of had to press the reset button, didn't they, at the end of every episode, so that if you kind of dropped in on the next one and you hadn't seen any yeah, before... It, it would have been great if there had been a thread yeah. going through not just, you know, um, Haldane's and yeah. Brogan's lives, but mm-hmm. but, uh, but the minor, m- more minor characters mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. You might have... Um, I don't think the audience had a chance to kind of identify or really get to know yeah. the people. And so th- there was not room, much room for real empathy. Yeah. Which is a shame. And, uh, you know, as you mentioned, Space Precinct came along when you were sort of well into your career, uh, by a couple of decades, I should imagine. Yep. Lots of uh, credits behind you already. So let's take a look at uh, one that I managed to dig out. This is from, uh, I think, oh gosh, 1960s. It's uh, an episode from The Avengers. Probably was 60s, yeah. Let's have a look at this. That is not me. <laughs> it's got your posture. It could have been. <laughs> there I am. Oh my God, smoking. Yeah, you see, different times. Come in. Wilson? Sir? Anything happened to your end? Not a sign, sir. It's gone 12. I know, sir. Can't make it out. Our information clearly stated that one of their men had a rendezvous in this area at 12. So this is quite yes, early sir. days in your career, going isn't to it? pass on something vital, that's what we heard. Are you sure you've seen no one? Only an old lady on a bicycle, sir. What? Went by a few moments ago, sir. You fool! Get after her, man! Get after her! Yes, sir. Do you remember shooting any of this? Yeah. Aha. Uh-huh. Where was this? Where was the location? Do you remember? No. Nope. But some money's been spent on it. That's the first thing anybody says when they see a helicopter, there's money on <laughs> There you go. <laughs> they didn't ask me if I could ride a motorcycle. <laughs> you think that would have been top of the list. But, you know, look at this. Man, that's not you, surely. <laughs> yeah, I did that. <laughs> How much of this is that isn't you? <laughs> It's a great sequence, though, isn't it? That was me. That was him, wasn't it? Wow, I couldn't do that, huh? <laughs> How could I have missed that? <laughs> Terrible <laughs> shot. You always were. Was, I think that was directed by Phil Dudley. Ah. Who I worked with on Softly Softly. Right. Oh, that's not right. John, oh, John Huff. Huff. Oh, John Huff. There you go. There we are. Uh, Super Secret Cypher Snatch, I think, was the name of that episode of The Avengers. Super Secret Cypher Snatch. That's it. Yes. Easy for you to say. <laughs> um, not the last time you would hold a, 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 a weapon in your hand, of course, and fire it in anger. Because it's no. space precinct, <laughs> we had a, a, a lot of a uh, lot of gun action, didn't we? I had none. Ah, none. Because you were stuck behind the desk. I was. I was shot as Calamandro. <laughs> right. But I never wielded a weapon of my own. So does that mean you had one of those little squibs placed under your costume? Do yep. you remember those? Yep. Extraordinary. Mm. Terrifying the first time you do it, isn't it? Because you're never quite sure how it's going to go. Yeah. Um, so. What were your hopes and dreams as a young actor? Where would you like to have seen yourself or were you just intent to keep working wherever that came from? I think when I was at drama school, I saw myself doing Shakespeare. Yeah. And I never did. Ah, yeah. I wish I had. Yeah. Um, I still wish I would. Yeah. But... um, no, that's what I. That's what I. I kind of fantasized about, but then when you're thrown out into the wide open world, you just want to work. Mm, and indeed, my first job was 
acting ASM in weekly rep. Right. So we did eight shows in nine weeks. Extraordinary. Unbelievable. Yeah. I mean... Eight different parts, eight different plays. Yep. And doing stage management as well. And so, you would be what sort of what they call players cast, I guess. Where oh you, yeah, yeah. You could be playing an old man one week, a butler, and then you play the romantic lead I've the next week. I've got photographs of myself with grey hair and, <laughs> and a very young face. And yes. Absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> but um, I loved it. Mm. I mean, yeah. it was work. Yeah. And, and I was getting seven pounds ten shillings a week. Not to be sniffed at. <laughs> yeah, great. Uh, now, we have here, you may have noticed, a Space 1999 lunchbox mm. containing questions from our viewers and listeners. Lovely. So I wonder, David, if you would just reach into here and let's take, say, four out of there. Four questions for you to answer for this week and then we'll do four more later. Okay. How's that? Okay. And off you go. Rich Goodborn. Uh -huh. Hello. Hello. What did you think of the quality of voice dubbing for Space Precinct? Is it more off-putting when you can remember the actor's real voice? Hmm. Well, there's a story. Yeah. Um, I thought the quality of voice dubbing, I think, was pretty good. Um, as to can I remember the actor's real voice, well, I dubbed myself. Um, and I think, if I'm right, um, Lou Hirsch and I were the only ones who did, at the beginning anyway, certainly. Yeah. I think more actors started doing their own voices later on. But, um, yeah, we, on the first day, we were rehearsing in English accents and we were told that American accents would be required. Um, and... So I asked my agent to ask if we could be auditioned. Um, and we were, and I, I got the gig. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I never did. I never got the gig. I think I was the only regular actor by the end of the series not to use my own voice, because Mary Woodfine did. Did she? Yeah, about halfway through. Oh, no, um, Jerome, Jerome did. Jerome did. Yeah, he, he did Irish. Yeah. yeah. An Irish alien. <laughs> Another question. <laughs> Lauren J. Gradwell. Hi, mm -hmm. Lauren. I grew up during the 90s. All right. <laughs> yeah, don't rub it in, Lauren. As a Jerry Anderson fan and watched Space Precinct after school, a fellow fan told me that you have a link to another great interest of mine, the Titanic. Yes, I do. Uh -huh. Did you know your grandfather well? And did he have any influence on your life and the decisions you made during your career? Well, I did know him very well. I was born in his house. and <laughs> Was he in at the time? Yes. <laughs> and we lived with him for the first six years of my life. Oh. And he put me through school. Oh. Um, he never once mentioned the Titanic. I think he suffered from survivor's guilt. Um, the first I knew of it was in, I think, 1952 when my mother accompanied him to the premiere of A Night to Remember, which was the Kenneth Moore mm. film he played, Light Holler. And uh, even then I wasn't really aware of what it was all about. I, I didn't really know what the Titanic was. Um, but gradually I did get to know, and, and I, uh, my grandfather wrote a book, which I, I fortunately to have a first edition of. Um, and so I, in a way I got to know him even better through that than, uh, I mean, he died when I was about 22 or three, I think, um, at the age, I think he was 90-ish. Um, but yes, um, I, we were, I, f I felt close to him, yeah. Amazing. Amazing to have that link with such a huge historical moment. I know, I know, Incredible. and it's, it's, it's almost bigger now than... Yeah. yeah. I mean, right. It was obviously massive at the time, yeah. but, but then it went through a long sort of period, and I, but no, it's, it's extraordinary. Mm. It's extraordinary. Uh, another couple of questions, David? Right. 
Rob Slater. Hi, Rob. If there had been season two, where would you have liked Fredo to have gone? <laughs> I can't answer that one. <laughs> um, that's a tricky question, actually. Because there was, there was talk of a, of a season two, wasn't there? there was certainly... Oh, there was a big talk of yeah. season two, um, yeah. not to mention three and four. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I think I would like all the characters to have been explored more, mm. um, as we've said already. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think any dramatic series has potential for exploration and, um, and development. And it never happened, unfortunately. Mm. But, yeah, I, I, I don't know where I would have liked Fredo to have gone. Um, I think I probably would have liked him to have succeeded Podley. Right. Captain Fredo, you think? Captain Fredo. It's got a ring to it, isn't it? And a last question there I think you've got, David. Yep. Steve Bushell. Hi, Steve. Mm -hmm. You have a great resume of some classic TV. You do. I didn't know about that. That's true. <laughs> I've seen it. How did it feel to wear the prosthetics? Ah. Did it help to get you into your character or did you feel too restricted? Well, good question, actually. Um... Wearing the prosthetics was not a problem at all. Um, obviously, any actor, your face is part of your toolkit. Mm. Um, so it, it presents difficulties, but then a lot of, you know, a lot of theatre has been done with masks and, mm -hmm. you know, there is such a thing as mask work. Mm. So you, you express in a different way. Um, I suppose more physically, um, although I, I'm not sure if we did that really. We 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 moved about like human beings, um, and to all intents and purposes, we were human beings with masks. Yeah. Um, did it help to get into the character? No, it didn't, um, because th these weren't just masks; they were full heads that you you, you were put into and it was zipped up the back um, and and the eyes were somewhere up here and and you looked through the sort of um, bags under your eyes mm. um, <clears throat> and very restricted views so it, it was restricting but the actual acting part of it I think was the same as any any other job um, in as much as you learnt your lines you Tried not to bump into the furniture. <laughs> you bumped into the furniture <laughs> and the set and anything else that was happened to be yeah. around um, and your other and other characters <laughs> and um, yeah, it was you know it was it was a job and you you made the best of it, I guess. From my point of view, what, what I seem to remember is you know quite apart from all the usual actorly things that you have to think about in terms of the character and so on and your emotional journey or whatever it might be was just the simple technical things in a mask of having to find your light hit your mark on the floor do you remember they used to put those what they call sausages those little bean bags on the floor yes. so you could feel with your foot yeah. when you were in the right position because you couldn't see no. i mean walking downstairs was always terrifying because of course your vision was out there and the only way to see where your feet were was to go like that and, of course, you couldn't do that in the mask, so you literally had to feel your way down a flight of stairs. I'd Terrifying. forgotten about those details, but yes. now you remind me, they yeah. fill me with horror. Yeah, yeah, that's right, and the constant noise of the motors in your... Oh, so, that's right, yes. So you had little time to think about character. It was all about, am I in the right place? Am I facing in the right direction? Where well, do I go you next? you say that, but actually all I was thinking about was character. Right. Um, well, let's put that to the test and let's look at another early clip from your career, David. Oh, yeah. One that I think brings you quite a bit of attention among sci-fi fans because it's from Blake Seven. Uh -huh. Let's have a look at this. Our duty target's nice and steady now, sir. Doesn't move for an hour. Then presumably Eigen's got back to base. You're having to do that very tricky thing here of delivering your lines whilst playing chess. And then pressing buttons. All launchers mobile, sir. Ready launches three and seventeen. Oh, he's a lovely guy. Yeah. Neem. Christopher Neem. Right. Uh huh. Three and seventeen locked on. Primary oh, relay wow. open. Safety lock clear. Yeah. 
The no. costumes are a little over the top, aren't they, don't you think? Countdown. Four. Three. Two. Well, his was a lot more glamorous than mine. <laughs> There we go. Uh, an episode called Traitor, I think, from Blake Seven in the 70s. Mm. Um, I mean, it's odd, isn't it, that you, you... I wouldn't say you've done so much sci-fi because, of course, you've got a long and broad career, but it seems to be punctuated by The Avengers, which I suppose is science fantasy, and then Blake Seven and Doctor Who and Space Precinct. I mean, it... it uh, I, I never saw... I never saw, saw them as sci-fi. Ah, yeah. I saw them as jobs. Yes. Um, that was directed by a guy called David Sullivan Proudfoot, who I'd worked with on, on Softly Softly. Right. Um, very nice guy. Yeah. Um, and he offered me the job. Yeah. Uh, and so I went and did the job. And you don't really think, oh, this is sci-fi, so it's sure. different. Sure, True. Because basically acting is acting is acting, I yeah. think. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. So, I, yeah, you don't think you've got to behave differently, or, mm -hmm. and I think that character was a human being. Yes, um, to all intents and purposes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not fully rounded, <laughs> but <laughs> Blake Seven wasn't known for it, I don't think. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, all for now, David. Will you come back again next week and uh, do much the same again? More questions from our viewers and uh, show a few more clips from your career? Would that be okay? Well, no, I don't think so. I mean, it's a three and a half hour drive. Thank you very much. <laughs> see you next week. <laughs> David Quilter. Oh, you see? What a lovely chap. So lovely. He's great value, isn't he? Yeah. Drove all the way down from Suffolk to be with yeah. us. How many hours is that? Three hours, 40 minutes. Yeah. Oh. I know. Thank you, David. Yeah, it's lovely. So nice. uh, am I allowed to say that he'll also be cropping up on... Um, a certain Blu-ray release. We haven't really talked about that, probably. so you can hint. Well, you yeah, can talk yes, about it. Yes. Yes. Well, I think I just hinted, didn't I? There we yes. are. Uh, anyway, David will be back next week for the second part of his interview, uh, and then we've got Dallas Campbell coming up the week after that, presenter and adventurer. Uh, I love the fact that a... somebody can call themselves yeah. an adventurer. No, I'm calling him an adventurer. <laughs> they not call himself that? No, he should. No. Uh, so yes, lots more to come on the Jerry Anderson podcast. Hurrah! Brilliant. But for now, it's time to hear from our pesky podstrons. Whoa. Pesky stuff in science. This is the voice of the Podsterons. Chris, over to you. Okay. First one says, hello, Jamie, Richard, Chris. Hello. Oh, nice. Hello. hello. It's nice. Richard, yes. I know you won't remember me. Oh, right. But I'm the chap in the seventh Doctor pullover with whom we had a brief chat at Brit Sci-Fi last year. Oh. Yes, he's, he's right. Memory? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I told you that I had not watched Space Precinct since it was on BBC Two. But I had bought the box set DVD and would rewatch it soon. I yeah. remember yeah. him now. Do you? Yeah. Yes, good. because you went, oh, that's good, isn't it? Lovely. Did I? It was yeah. nice. You were quite pleasant. Oh, it was a good day then, wasn't it? You got good Richard. You got nice Richard that mm. day. Yeah. When it was mentioned in the podcast that it is Precinct's 30th anniversary, I duly dusted down the box set and have now watched the whole series and was very impressed with storylines and the cast. It certainly had Jerry's stamp on it and is a very underrated series. It is. Well, Absolutely. yeah. Absolutely. Jamie, you mentioned this year's Brit Sci-Fi quite a few pods ago. Mm. Are you going to attend this year? Oh, yes. That's coming up, isn't it? Well, I, I've got to be honest. We're very happy to. Not um, asked. But we've, no, we, we had a kind of email exchange months and months ago saying, would you like to come? And we said, yeah, yeah, it would be great. There's no more. Uh -huh. Not heard anything ah. since. I don't know whether we're not wanted or whether oh. they're just expecting that we'll turn up. But if anybody would like to, you know, nudge Brit Sci-Fi yeah. to get in touch with us and help us get there that would be great well, when is it I mean it must be soon I don't September know sometime, September sometime usually point, yeah. Yeah, I know there. nothing mm. also don't suppose there's any chance of collecting together the TV comic strips of Four Feather Falls Supercar and Fireball XL5 these would be a lovely an addition to the anthologies already and soon to be published yes that's tricky uh, maybe maybe, maybe. No, it's Never not in no. our immediate plan to the next kind of 18 months mm. but beyond that possibly would be nice yeah, mm. yeah. And speaking of would be nice, Chris, love the secrets of the Secret Service book. Aww. Thank you very much. Uh, a good year to read and rewatch as it's the 55th anniversary. Are you planning to write any more secrets of books? Yeah, so? Chris. Yeah, come well, on. It would be nice. Yeah, secrets of the podcast. Secrets of, secrets of the podcast. Oh, no, which no, there are let's many. not do yes. that. Um, I'd like to, yes. It's just a question of finding the time. 
The time yeah. is the problem, time isn't it? Is we need we need Christel clones because <laughs> oh, then we can do yes. a lot, much more. We that really don't. Amazing. Yeah. Well, I would like Chris to do some more secrets of books, but as he says, it's the time. Yes. Okay. So you can either have a book or you can have what I'm doing at the moment, space precinct related that you mentioned. <coughs> yes. Yeah, yeah it's kind, of of kind of both. Kind of both. That's right. Yeah, you just have to wait. That's you right. Probably yeah. could, but does anyone want me? Yeah. With regard to the Prisoner's Lotus run at the start of most episodes... Oh, yes. According to Avengerland, it was filmed at Santa Pod Raceway in Bedfordshire. Because wasn't there something in the Protectors that we thought could was... Same car? Uh, possibly yeah, the, or same location? The first or? circle, maybe, is filmed at an airfield. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, look forward to the pods every Sunday night. Oh. Thanks, John Stock. Oh, thanks, thanks John. Cheers, John. That's nice. Yeah. And I do remember you. Uh, hi, Jamie, Richard and Chris, says Daryl Smith. I noted with interest the question regarding story submissions a couple of pods uh, ago and the yes. totally reasonable response about only accepting them through an agent. I wonder, however, if you would ever consider a one-off submission window in the style of the annual in initiatives from BBC Writers' Room and the 2000 AD comic. You could set the parameters of which IPs were allowed and what type of content would be suitable. Perhaps this could lead to a collection of stories by the fans which could take the characters and situations into undreamt of directions. Many thanks, Daryl Smith. Well, Daryl Smith, yeah. that's nice. I mean, you yeah. know, Big Finish obviously do their um, Paul Sprague, Paul yeah. Sprague submission thing, right. short stories, which is nice and often leads to some good stuff. One of the problems we've got is just as Chris has kind of alluded to with his time issue, mm. is, is is bandwidth mm. for stuff. Mm. We've got there's so much stuff that comes in and that we're working on, we just yeah. don't have the resource to read a hundred submissions to go through hundreds mm. of submissions. Yeah. So, and it's very tricky. And also, with our ITV license, there are certain parameters that we, we must fit into, um, and they are they're quite restrictive actually. Mm. Um, and so then we kind of end up hamstringing mm. uh, your, you, your creative sensibilities potentially. Mm. So, but it is early days as well for this original <laughs> fiction that we're doing. So oh God, yeah. Say never. No, never say never at all. I mean, we've we, you know we've only been able to do it for a few months, and mm. we've we've got lots of stuff coming out and underway and it's all very exciting yeah so yes let's let's so see. I know I with, like with my novel future. it it wasn't just a case of having it passed by the editor it also had to go before itv yes at, at every like, stage yeah so yes yeah but let's go. see yeah. I, it would be nice to do in time yeah there you go. Oh, is, is an email for me to do. You, Jamie. Oh, is there? Oh, yeah. okay there you go. Uh, hi all hi i uh, just wanted to send my thanks to everyone for the hard work they did to create another great jerry anson concert in birmingham it wasn't me uh, like, you helped. Did I? You were there. Oh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just, just by your presence. <laughs> um, these events take a lot of organisation and background work and stress. You are absolutely right. They do. Uh, so thank you all for so much of the efforts you've gone to in creating another great Anderson event for us to all, to all enjoy. Mm, there. Right. Very happy to do so. Glad yeah. you enjoyed it. Yeah, great. The weekend was made even more special because I could spend it with my fellow podders, creating many more happy memories. Yeah. Oh. That nice. We may see each other on Zoom nearly every Saturday, but when we're together in real life, it's just the best time, and it's always sad to say goodbye. Oh, yeah, oh, sweet. It is lovely that the gang all get together. In fact, yeah. when, I, when I left the Symphony Hall afterwards to see them all there, this huge crowd. <laughs> yes, uh, Willow with her selfie stick. Exactly, yes. <laughs> this happy and slightly mad bunch. Uh, it was really lovely to see. Uh, anyway, uh, Lauren continues. So uh, now I'm looking forward to being with my fellow Potters at another event. On Sunday, September the 1st, the 1966 film Thunderbirds Argo is being shown at the Plaza uh, 1930s Super Cinema in Stockport. Oh, is it? Well, wow. Didn't know that. Mm -hmm. That's the cinema used by Talking Pictures TV. Oh. Um, I can't wait to see the film on the big screen for the first time, and I'm looking forward to seeing all the podders there. Thanks again for keeping up all the good work from Lauren Jane Bradwell. Lovely. Oh. Isn't that nice? Yeah. Uh, so don't forget, you can send your emails into podcast.jerryanson.com and we will more than likely read them out. Mm. More than likely. Yeah, well, it's not, really, not yeah. if they're offensive or repetitive. Well, yeah. or, uh, yeah. Other ways to get in touch include commenting on our YouTube channel. We get lots yes, of comments indeed. on our YouTube channel uh, uh, beneath, beneath every podcast. Some yes. of them are quite nice. Some of them are complimentary. There is one comment I would like to address that uh -oh. comes up fairly regularly, I uh -oh. just on recent episodes. Uh -oh. That uh -oh. is the question of the Stingray Technical Operations Manual. <gasps> yeah. When can we expect on that because the cover has been released right yes, yes. okay yes who knows what sort of news do you want it's coming well, i don't know do i'm thinking the people that, the people at home want oh, you want a, you want a release date do you well they don't okay well i can't tell you a release date okay uh certainly pre-christmas oh is what I can tell you. Right. that's so right. good pro probably probably november release i would guess yeah that's an exclusive guess well done um Fantastic. which is the best i can offer yeah but no, no uh chris chris t has almost finished it 
I've seen some lovely bits and pieces from there. In fact, I saw Stingray passing through a bunch of what looked like giant squid, <laughs> uh, which was rather lovely. Uh, so yes, more soon. Great. Question answered, I'd say. Sorted. Sorted. Yeah. Now, talking of answering questions, a little earlier on, when David was answering my questions mm. for the first part of his interview, I also asked him to press the randomizer button to oh, choose yes. a random episode of a random Jerry Anderson series for us to watch in the randomizer. Did he do what? it? Well, do you want to see? Yes. Here he is. All right, folks, I'm going to press the randomizer button. Are you ready? Three, two, one. Right, well done, David. Let's see. Uh, oh, 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 that was oh, quick. Wow. Was quickly. wow. That was quick. Okay. Well, so, I don't think you chaps have seen an episode of Supercar Around This Table. Not Around This Table. I know I've not watched an episode of Supercar Around This Table. Until now. Yeah. Whoa. Great. Exciting. Tell us everything we need to know about Supercar in 10 seconds or less. Supercar 39 episodes started in 1961. It's about the adventures of a team that have built this wonderful car called Supercar. And there's Mike Mercury, who's the test pilot, and Dr. Peeker, who's the, the, the Professor Popkiss, and Jimmy Gibson, who is annoying, and, he's, and yeah, he's waffling he's down. Go on over, adventures. Yeah. Well, you're way over. Yeah, 16 wow. seconds. There's a, lot to, there's a lot to cover. OK. Yeah, there's a Supercar and they mess around in it, basically. Um, Jamie. <laughs> yes. Specs on. Oh, specs on. Do we get to sing the song? You can sing the song if you like. Yeah, now, with or with everyone else? Go on. Um, it flies through the air with something under grace. Ah. He's got a big hair and a lovely long face. <laughs> now, Super this is cut. interesting. No. I've uploaded the wrong version. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, because this is what's on the network Blu-ray. Okay. The first eight episodes don't have oh, the song. Got ah. I cut missing. together a version with the song on the front. Ah. ah. And I've uploaded the wrong one. Well, it's just as well I sang it then, yes. isn't it? So, uh, this is Supercar. What year are we talking here, uh, We're talking 1960, 1961. Oh, right, OK. Yes. Uh, obviously, black and white. Yes, yes. Very, very much black and white, yes. Early days. Um, really their first step into the world of science fiction. OK. Yeah. Essentially, because everything uh, else has been either evil toys or we've had the Western of Four for the Falls. It's, it's, um, it's not the future yet. No, I was going to say, it's, it's the last... So if Mario Asian series set in the present day? Well, the, well, the Secret the Service is, is kind of present day, yeah. Is it? Yeah, I suppose. Hmm. Anyway, we have our uh, <laughs> very uh, handsome Gibson brothers here. Oh, I thought you were talking about Mitch. Uh, no, no, Mitch is, all, Mitch is beyond handsome. <laughs> Mitch, is, Mitch is in a class all of his own. Uh, the little one is Jimmy, and the uh, grown-up one is Bill. Right. Bill is a pilot. Yeah. Astronaut, yeah. diver, whatever the plot needs him to be that Chef. week, he's an expert at. Yeah, yes. Okay. Yes. Excellent. And they're already in trouble. It's, it's funny, every series seems to have a character like that that can just do whatever the plot. Yes. Yeah. We had, we had uh, who was the doctor in Space Precinct? Oh, Carson, Carson. yes. <laughs> doctor, scientist, forensic. Yeah. yeah, whatever you want. Over. Roger, organizing helicopter rescue, over. Roger, Hudson Field, impact in 30 seconds. That prop. Falcon 2 Sadly, not spinning. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Oh, no. And, of course, in uh, later shows, they would show that crash in glorious detail. Yeah. yeah. Okay. In these shows, we um, we have a model on a wire and a back projection of some real sky. Yeah. Oh, that's quite nice. Though. It is lovely, yeah. Very quick. Loud and clear. Report on visibility. Rescue Hudson. Although I've always been a bit disturbed by this pilot. His, that The helmet is the same colour as the skin. It looks like some kind of horrible <laughs> growth has happened by his skull. <laughs> <laughs> So where was this all shot? I'm guessing quite nearby. This is Slough, yeah. Yeah, yeah this is on the uh, training estate. Well, it's at the um, Pro Tires mm -hmm. base. Yeah, Ipswich Road. Yeah, Ipswich Road. <laughs> anyway, Mitch and Bill and good old Jimmy, they've escaped in a life raft. Bill is injured from uh, unspecified causes. Right, yeah. God. Proximity to Jimmy, potentially. Yeah, probably. <laughs> Open fracture, do we think? Yes, could be. Better look, over. Yes, yeah, so this, this instantly puts me in mind of Dad and his brother, Lionel, obviously. I wonder how much of an influence there is just in that instant yeah. thing of this idea of the, the kid character having a, mm. a hero brother to some degree, yes. even though he crashes. Roger, monitoring this frequency. And I love the mixing of, uh, of stock footage there as well. Yes. Yeah. The, uh, the action. It's something they do a lot in this first series. Right. Yeah, I'd love to know what that was real footage of presumably real yeah. people needing to be rescued yeah. at some point. Next pass, over and out. Quite ambitious, actually, isn't it? It's is very ambitious, yeah, for its time. And with this is our introduction to the supercar team. Mike Mercury and Professor Popkiss here. Uh -huh. in the lab. There she is, Mike. Oh, I mean that looks beautiful, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. What a lovely shot. 
And now I think she is nearly ready. I can't wait to fly her, Professor. He looks familiar. He does. I will be in the cockpit. What, and what is it about? Is it, is it the strange, isn't it? The hair, the eyebrows, yeah, chin, chin, nose, chin, nose, all of the above. Yeah. It's been a long time, but worth every minute. You hear that, Dr. Beaker? Hey, where's Beaker? Dr. Beaker! Mm, here, here. Beaker, what on earth are you doing? Mm, uh... And this episode was um, was written by uh, Martin Hugh Woodhouse, who wrote most of the episodes of the first series. In later shows, it would always be the first episode was written by, by Jerry and Sylvia. Uh -huh. But in this one, they've, they've essentially let someone else establish yeah. this world and these characters. Were, I see. Which is quite interesting. I should have thought you would have known that. It's, because uh... Supercar originally was... The, the supercar concept of this machine that could go anywhere and the heroic pilot was the was Jerry's concept. And then Martin and Hugh Woodhouse had this idea for a different show, Beaker's Bureau, which is about this scientist called Beaker, right. crazy inventions and yes, such. And true. they kind of smash these things together. Yeah. And I think it works really well. And yeah. you wouldn't know. It was a big surprise to me when I found out later. Yeah. This isn't one concept. This is two fused Hybrid. together. Yeah. How long did you say, Professor? Seven more. So they're getting news reports about the, uh, the boys lost at sea. No, the supercar than by rescuing those kids from the sea. Yeah. And there's only one craft fit to save the day, <laughs> but it's not been tested yet. No. Ah. Risky Classic. approach, isn't it? Mm. They've been asked to do it. They haven't got permission to do it, and it hasn't been tested. But let's try. Yeah, Two young not? boys' lives are at stake. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing else to do. A good time to try out my uh, clear view apparatus, would it not? Now, Ooh. don't you start, Beaker. Mike's bad enough. You know. I don't want to help these little boys. <laughs> Go away. You realize the trouble if we have that little kid back here? We look and, at him. And the monkey. And the monkey, yes. Oh, poor Mitch looks rather forlorn. He does. Hasn't there been any sign of a, a rescue plane? Yeah. It's quite it's atmospherically done with this, actually, with the back section. And, the, and yeah. there's some very sort of somber, almost organ music playing underneath that as well, which I don't think is Barry Gray stuff. Mm, a supercar. Yeah, but you know what the professor said, Doc? Not to move. So we have to talk more about potentially going out to rescue them. Time is the one thing we're short of. But I guess he's right. I believe so. I do believe so. For one thing, I should not feel entirely happy about the rocket outlets. Rocket outlets? Rocket outfits? Well, they are, you see, made... I rock a nice outfit. And I am... Oh, oh, yeah. What <laughs> happened to the ceramic of the launching bay? Uh... You would remember? I think the only thing that doesn't feel like a big step forward in this is the eyes, which still at yes. this point I find quite disturbing. Beaker's eyes are, I don't know, it, you kind of get the impression that they've never ever blinked any of these characters yeah. and their eyes are sort of reacting to it. They do move though, don't they, yes, slightly? About. Left and right. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they were. Yeah. yeah. Indicated. I think Mike looks good, I mean, for a, for a, a puppet. For, from this era. Yeah. It's having the hooded yeah, yeah. eyelid helps, mm. doesn't his, it? His eyes are well within his skull, <laughs> whereas Beaker's, they're about to fall out at any <laughs> moment. Uh, this. There's another terrific David Graham performance. And I've said all the way along, one of my favourite parts of this show is the relationship between these two. Mm. Be, uh, uh, CPR. And Graydon Gould is, I think, as Mike, one of the more underrated heroes of the, the puppet shows. He's got a great voice. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're all soon eclipsed, aren't they, by the, the Tracy brothers and then Spectrum. And yeah. They don't really get much of a look in, do they? Particularly being black and white. Yeah. Kind of fade into the, the past, which is a shame. It is only an opinion. There could be an explosion. Thanks. I love the comb over. <laughs> Such a nice touch. And now, I release the charge. I might go for that in years to come. <laughs> you really could. The thermite bomb. Most interesting. All so far, the story is told. Six characters. Have we met? Well, the six regulars and the yeah. two people doing the search. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Too long to bring this yeah, liquid to battle. Yeah. For infusion. Is this it is the the thing with this show, particularly with this episode, where you've got a concept of people needing to be rescued, but as a production, the show isn't quite at the level of being able to show the rescue uh -huh. in the way that Thunderbirds was. Yes. So we have to have these long dialogue scenes yeah. where nothing 
and this isn't related to the uh, the rescue at all. Yeah, yeah. Nothing happened. Yeah. No. Nah, most satisfactory. Uh, catchphrase <laughs> arrives. Good. Yeah. I will be with you in a moment, pilot. Yeah, he has got the look of David Graham about him, actually, hasn't mm. he? From certain angles. You like dogs? Uh, owners looking like their dogs. <laughs> yeah. The actors come to uh, their puppets. Most satisfactory. Jimmy. Meanwhile. Package in the side of the raft. Jimmy, we're gonna have to eat you to oh. survive. Oh. <laughs> I'll get you a drink of water. <laughs> It's helpful, Mitch, with the survivor rations. Don't. No, oh, no, he yeah. didn't. Yeah, we knew that was coming. Oh, Mitch. G Mitch. No, look what you did. G Mitch. I think you'd say something a little stronger than that. Push Mitch over the edge. I think. <laughs> oh, here we go. Chink. Oh. Cursed to the zero X. Yeah, there's a lot, of, a lot of procedure to be observed here. Before mm. we Got to be sure, though. How about? But is that done away with after the first episode? No, because ah, no. usually that Even, is the case. The first episode yeah. is like, oh, we've got to go through that, and then from then on, it's like just launch it. For a lot of the rest of the first series, each week there's a new addition or a new thing we're ah. going to try out, and we're not sure if this is going to work. I oh, see. but if we give it a try, I'm not sure. I don't right. So there's a lot of drama to be mined out of that, or a lot of uh, dialogue. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> dialogue, if not drama. Real flight test in five days. What do you think? But I, I've always felt that the um, the Woodhouse brothers, in writing for the show, they they trusted the the kids with a lot of sort of technical dialogue. It's, it's quite mature for a, a kid show of that time. Yeah, sure. Nothing. I was just wondering whether they've picked up those two in the raft yet. Oh yes. Oh god, I've completely forgotten about that. I was having such a lovely time. That ugly little boy. Yes. Where's his pig nose? It wasn't his fault. He didn't know. We just have to hope the rescue boys turn up soon, that's all. Bill, what about the die markers? Do you think Jimmy is in the top five most ugly child supermarination characters? I think five is being generous, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's got to be. Top three? It's got to be a toss between him and Torchy, really. Yeah. Wow. That's one harsh. of the Torchy kids. Yeah. 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 Oof. Just, um, it is the nose, yeah. I think. He might look okay if it just wasn't for the nose, the pig nose. Well, his brother say. looks better with the, yeah. the nose that's less um, caricatured. Yeah, maybe he grew out of it later on. Yeah. So here we are testing the... Uh, Smoke. This is the clear view. Oh, a clear view. It's a clear view. Uh, no smoke. No smoke. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. We don't seem Let's to have... watch it for five minutes. Oh. No smoke. Donk. Mm. Well, now who's a fool? I mean, that is an early precursor of the Jerry Anderson podcast set up, isn't it? Basically. <laughs> That's what we're seeing there. The, uh, and which one of us is the fool around this table <laughs> when it comes to technical things? <laughs> Hold on a minute, Mike. Bigger has just gone to look at... We the... have some emails from the Potsterons. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. As I think thought. cosplay as this. <laughs> yes. Well, you're, you're obviously Mike. So, <laughs> yeah. I will be Bigger, I suppose. Oh, I'm podcast, <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, sorry about that one, Mitch. Yeah. You'll see if the clear view works. Switching to clear view now, Professor. So we have a gas beaker. Mm hmm. We can establish whether we can see through smoke. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. amazing. Good stuff. Clever. That'll come in useful. Mm. Good I hope. That. Otherwise, it's been a bit of a pointless setup. <laughs> there. You should be all right now. I guess this means that Gizmo's passed the practical test, eh? Satisfactory. Most satisfactory. Very good. Uh, yes. What do you think, pilot? 4 0, Doctor. Good for your. What if Hopkins would have teased Baker yeah. and made him walk into something? Like yes. Hmm. <laughs> hey, these feel like the rocket motors of supercar, Professor. On. Video plan working. I recognize that sound effect from Thunderbirds as well. There is some sort of transmitter or yeah, yeah, sun probe, I want to say. Yeah. Like Those that. kids. You never give up, do you, Mike? You make it very difficult for me to say no. <laughs> oh, that's okay, Prof. <laughs> We've yet to see supercar being super. Yeah, or even a car. Yeah. Come on. Now I'm trying to rush you into a rescue fight. Oh, I don't blame you for refusing. 
Who's refusing One email a day. What's five years as compared to two lives? Right. Ooh. Well, fair enough. It's very philosophical. Mm. Yeah. It fits the, the strongly heroic elements of uh, later shows, particularly Thunderbirds. And this is interesting because we don't have a special effects department as such, so in lieu of a, a building, we have a painting of a building. Okay. Well, that was nice, then. Yes. And I think it only appears in that one shot. Uh -huh. And then in the second series, they built a full model, which is the one that turns up in the intro of uh, Thunderbirds and gets destroyed. Yes. Nice. Get his tie caught. The spinning <laughs> circle. <laughs> yeah. Although this is a show that uses a lot of uh, non-Barry Gray library stuff, this is a Barry Gray track, mm. and it just sounds so nice and heroic, and yeah, it does. off we go to the rest. Charging pot engine. Oh. Right, we're gonna, we're gonna launch. Come on, then. Give it four or five minutes, and yeah. we'll be in the air. <laughs> yeah. Got to have this count up. 9,000. Right. 11,000. 13,000. Oh, I see. Yeah. 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 How high has he got to go? 15,000. Oh, 15, that sounds about right. Correct, Vigo. Will you confirm, please? Then we've got to do the other engine as well. <clears throat> oh. Charging stop. And again, it's like with Thunderbirds, the ritual of the launch oh, sequence. God. This became part of it. Oh, uh, absolutely. It's just not as romanticizable as yeah. Thunderbirds launch or yeah. Stingray launch because there's less, less going on, is there? Mm. But it's still it's tension counted. building. It's trouble, Professor. Uh oh. oh. Danger. Oh, no. Danger. I can't hold off much longer. Mike, what does she eat? Yeah, ignore it, it's fine. I'm switching over to standby. Still. <laughs> ah! I love me, how me, vague me, the me. danger sign is. It's like yeah. danger, but we're not going to specify <laughs> yeah. what. I think I have a suggestion. Well, let's have it then, quick. Uh, but I think, uh, I only think, mind you, oh. that if you were to try turning the starboard engine air feed pressure line on and off in the. Turn it, off and on again. turn it on and off again. Cycling, I mean, even then, amazing. Is the answer. Uh, you might succeed in clearing it, uh, but it's only a theory. Okay, theory it is. Here it goes. Switching off, switch back on. Oh, perfect. There we go. Ah. Good for you, Dr. Beaker. Well done, Dr. Beaker. 9,005. I love as well how natural Graydon Gould sounds with all this. I mean, as dialogue on the page, it's fairly dull and flat, but yeah. he puts a lot of energy into yeah. it. Yeah. Fire two! Did he have any aviation military past or something um, like that? Not to my knowledge, I mean, yeah. possibly. It just sounds like somebody who's done these mm. uh, procedures. Mm. Here we have this lovely looking up at the heavens music. It was another part of the... Uh, Launch ritual. Yep. Well, you can see lots of precursor moments to Stingray and Thunderbirds mm. and Wild Fireball, of course. And the fact that they're all living together almost like a family. As yes. Such. Critical take off now. No chances now. Before they go off and save someone, they'll have a spot of breakfast and read a newspaper or whatever. <laughs> yes. It's got a touch of all creatures great and small to yeah. it, hasn't it? <laughs> Has it? <laughs> <laughs> the quaintness yeah. of the group. Right, when you okay. come back, Mike, I need you to assist me with a cow. <laughs> yes. Hey, up, veterinary. <laughs> oh, oh, look. Let's acquire some sunglasses from somewhere. Hang on, but we missed the actual moment of launch, didn't we? No, that was it, just going up. Yeah, yeah and it's up. that was it. That was it. Okay. Right. Stability. This is the real test. For extend, yeah. R for attract, I suppose. Oh, I see. okay. Nice oh. B for brick and R for mo. <laughs> That's a very old joke. <laughs> very appropriate. Yeah. How are you feeling now, Bill? Not. I'd literally forgotten about these guys. <laughs> yeah, we were so <laughs> yeah. entranced by <laughs> Supercar's launch sequence. Okay. Just plotting more ways to be useful. Yeah. Which one he's going to eat first? Mm. <coughs> looks massive there, actually. Yeah. Looming like a Wookie. horrible monster. Yeah. It can be long now. If anyone can find us in this. Here it comes. <sighs> Supercar calling base. Oh, he's got shades on. Yeah. 
cool. He's a cool dude. Yeah. Switching to clear view. All right, Mike. Select. Ah. Can't see anything, Professor. They must have drifted during the night. Oh. 30, 32. And of course, I think this cloud footage, a lot of this, certainly for the opening titles, your dad went up in a plane with the cameraman. Yeah. And there was an issue with... He had one lung. He had one John, lung. Was it John Reed who did it, I think? Could be, I'm not sure. I think it was John Reed. The guy on the camera had one lung, yeah. and the pilot couldn't come down too fast because he had a... Or the co-pilot had a, a cold or something, and if he came down too fast, his eardrums would rupture or something. Yeah, and John so couldn't, just, couldn't breathe up there, so yeah. having to come down as so quickly as possible. Yeah. What on earth? Yeah. More dramatic than the first episode of Super Guys, so. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah, you can see that moment in a sort of biopic. Can't yeah, you? absolutely. Sort of actual jeopardy. <laughs> You're right. There's a noise straight above us. <gasps> yeah, I can hear it too. Of course, we haven't mentioned that the, this is David Graham doing the voice of Mitch. Ah. Oh. For which he went to London Zoo and studied real monkeys. Of course he did. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> Clear up here, but heavy fog below me. Am I at your calculated position, Doc? According to my computation. I'll lose a little altitude then. At this height, I could even miss them with the clear view. Cutting horizontal drive. Altitude 1,100 feet. Dangerous. Yeah. Switching to clear view now. Watch your monitor, Dr. Beaker, and keep your fingers crossed. <laughs> Supercar! Same from earlier. Yeah. There they are. Hey. It's a good picture. Now. It's a good picture. <laughs> it looks lovely on, on Blu-ray. Yeah. But how are they going to rescue them? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> Will it be answered? Mitch! Well, you just see a rope coming to shot. <laughs> Will they cut it? around it? Um, yes. <laughs> yes. Space now flying in heavy mist. Preparing for... Oh, that's nice. Yeah. yeah. It's landing on the sea. Do you think it... Really because we can't really pull off a, a rescue sequence as such. We can have a discussion about rescuing them while the actual rescue takes place off camera, essentially. Uh, so that's good. what they're going to do. Yeah. Now, uh, why does that look different, that shot? Oh, look here. That perfection and... It just didn't look quite as sharpened. Yeah, there's there's something they've done to those exterior shots yeah. to try and match it. I mean, it works, uh -huh, isn't it? got you. So it blends it. Yeah. OK, down he goes. There's that noise again, Mitch. My head's going kind of funny, Mitch. Mitch. You're talking to a monkey, Jimmy. <laughs> yes. Mitch. You've been drinking the salt water again. <laughs> Uh, oh, ah, there, oh! There he is. <laughs> ah, okay, that's neat. Okay, I'm alongside the raft. Are you sure you want me to rescue these guys? <laughs> Hold him steady in the water. Is that altogether wise, Professor? What do you so this is what they're doing in lieu of showing the rescue. Yeah, but okay, at least we saw but the thing. We saw a supercar it's, landing next yeah, to them, so yeah. we can imagine. Beg your pardon. Quite like fast cutting arguments. Mm. That keeps the energy yeah. up. -ish. Yeah. And it's all nice character stuff. Which, of course, he's not Super quite... Card face. Super uh, so I guess the next shot we're going to see oh. is... <laughs> there you go. Perfect. Good show. For you, Mike! How are they? I've got the pilot in the back. I think his leg's broken. The boy's oh. OK, but I guess he's out for the count. Right. And there's a monkey for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> he looks like a devious little guy. Oh. There's no need to worry. You say everything. To be all right. Oh, that was a bit spooky. <laughs> yeah. You are now my captive. Yeah, he it looks does terrified. <laughs> and where's my brother, Bill? He put you in pajamas. Mm. <laughs> who, who put me in pajamas? <laughs> he's not hurt bad then. Doc says he's going to be all right. Yeah. <laughs> Is Doctor Beaker a medical doctor? Uh, I don't think so. I was wondering who's given the medical attention. Yeah. Why not take them to a hospital or something? Wow. Well, I yeah. would say Beak is a doctor of everything. Practically everything. <laughs> Practically everything. <laughs> well, it came down and it picked us up. Tell me, Jimmy, was it something like this? Oh. Wow. Then it wasn't a dream after uh, all. No, it really Quite was. a fantastic place to have a bedroom. Hmm. <laughs> Don't worry about the fumes. No. <laughs> yeah. the, the rocket motors are quite in line with the room. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, is that it? Yeah, that's it. 
I'm glad you like it, Jimmy boy, because as soon as you're well, Jimmy huh? boy, you're coming up with me for a Oh, bit. yes, please. I'm taking you to an orphanage, Jimmy. I think it's for the best. Oh, God. Where's Mitch? Yeah, there's no sort of moment where they decide, actually, you're going to stay here and live with us if you want to. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'd love to. It's just yeah. next week. He's, you are. They, they never get rid of him. <laughs> Since you're here. Yeah. yeah, that's right. They have this child's bed for no reason. You may as well use it. That's <laughs> a set of pajamas. <laughs> mm. Mm, uh, uh, there seems to be some sort of uh, chimpanzee loose. Uh, some uh, sort of chimpanzee. It's the Zwellin subplot all over again, isn't mm. it? He's, a, he's quite extraordinarily intelligent. It, in some ways, but rather destructive. I believe now I come to think of it. It's supposed to be characteristic of chimpanzees. I do like the relationship that builds with Beaker and Mitch through the series. Mitch essentially becomes Beaker's right-hand man in uh-huh. certain projects. Yeah, and such. yeah. But here he's just causing trouble. Yeah. And there's a there's a shot of him coming up that I love, where he's just looking to the camera as if to say, "Yeah, I'm just here to cause trouble. <laughs> Deal with it." That shot. <laughs> he's just like. <laughs> What to expect, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'd also have to imagine that um, David was great fun to be around in the recording booth when he's being his monkey. Yes. Uh, I say, is everything all right? Yeah, Dr. Beaker, everything's under control. It looks as though we've found a co-pilot. Yeah. Well, Ta-da. On that note. Okay. Well, that's it. That ends the first oh. episode of so not- Supercar. Oh, okay. Yes. There we are. Yeah. I mean, there was a lot to enjoy in there. Yeah, I've always really liked it. But yeah, I'm yeah. not sure it didn't outstay its welcome 25 minutes. Oh, I think we could have dealt with most of that in 12. Yeah. yeah. For the time, it's yes. it, it's great stuff. Yeah. Compared to, I mean, obviously it's, it's over 60 years old now. But even compared to the other shows, a lot of the Supercar episodes are quite slow. But if you're in the mood for that and you, you like the show on its own merits, as yeah. I do, it's, yeah. it's perfectly Absolutely. fine. Absolutely. Lovely. Uh, Mark's out of five, Chris. Ooh. I mean, purely as a supercar episode, ranking it against other supercar episodes. Um, I think I'll go for a three. Mm. So just over. I don't want to be too cruel. I'm going to go halfway and say two and a half. I'm with you. Yeah. Two and a half. For what it is, sweet. I'm doing some really nice stuff. Yeah. But uh, not a lot happened. And we didn't see a lot happen. It was talked about, though. Yes, which is good. <laughs> so, Podstrons, do you agree? Uh, the first episode of Supercar. First episode, yes. Uh, I mean, were you there back in the day? Do you remember watching that very episode? Someone might do. Yeah, possible. Uh, how would you rate that out of five? Let us know in the comments below this YouTube video. Uh, in the meantime, that's it for Pod 324. Wow. Well we finally got the number right by the end. Uh, a quick reminder of my Space Precinct competition. Right mm. in uh, in the subject line, Space Precinct competition, and in the body of the email, what does RSA stand for, and also the name you would like to be included in the book. And we'll see you next time for more Randomizer, for more news, mm. and more David Quilter. And more Postal. Yes. Hooray! Hurrah! See you then. Bye. Let's get started. Let's go. Spectrum is green. RSA? Richard's silly ask? Oh, I wonder where oh. that was going. Yeah. I have to say, it was quite nice after four weeks to actually sit and watch an episode with you. Was it? Yeah. Did you miss it last Back time when you were oh, yes, skiving? I had to go. I had to go to an audition, as you remember. Yes. I'm very pleased to report I got the job. Congratulations. Oh. I'm actually under so the I, I can't tell you. No, I'm not leaving you, Chris. You see the hope in his eyes. <laughs> yeah. Can't tell you what it was, right. but just keep an eye out over Christmas. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Bye. That was an Anderson Entertainment production.